Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Patrick McGrain, Associate Professor of Criminal Justice. Each year, the School of Arts and Sciences at Gwen and Mercy University offers campus conversations, a series of lectures, presentations, and panel discussions focused on a theme that is relevant, timely, and connected to our mission, core values, and the critical concerns of our sponsors, the Sisters of Mercy. The goal is to create and encourage dialogue on those topics as part of our commitment to intellectual inquiry and lifelong learning, and to highlight the expertise of our faculty and other scholars and disciplines related to the theme. This year's theme is systemic racism. Tonight's presentation, Protecting All Communities, Building an Anti-Racist Police Force, is the third event of our five-part series for the year. In other sessions, we explore topics such as protesting and looting, racism in artificial intelligence, structural racism in civil rights, and racism in education. For more information on any of the other events in this series, please see the news and events page of our website. If you are participating live this evening, please enter your questions and comments via the chat function, and we will address as many as possible during the Q&A session. This evening, I am pleased to welcome three panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Andrea Headley an assistant professor in the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. She is a scholar of criminal justice policy, public management, and racial equality. Her research focuses on policing to understand how organizational, managerial, and individual level factors affect service deli delivery and outcomes with a keen focus on inequities and disparities. Specific examples of her past work include improving police community relations in communities of color, assessing the effect of race during use of force encounters, evaluating body-worn cameras, understanding national police reform commissions, analyzing dispositional outcomes in citizen complaints, and exploring the gendered norms and cultures in policing. Dr. Headley enjoys working directly with public sector organizations, such as police departments, to conduct both applied and engaged research to improve service delivery and racial equity. Our second panelist is Dr. Robert Kane, Professor of Criminology and Justice Studies at Drexel University. Dr. Kane's primary research interests include, include police authority and accountability, communities, crime and health, and technology and justice. Dr. Kane completed a study of police misconduct in the NYPD to date the largest study of misconduct ever conducted in American police in an American police agency. Since then, Dr. Kane has published numerous peer review articles on police misconduct, legitimacy and accountability in the NYPD, culminating in his 2013 book, Jammed Up, Bad Cops, Police Misconduct and the NYPD, co-authored with Dr. Michael White. Dr. Kane and his colleagues were awarded a grant from the National Institute of Justice to examine the effects of the taser on cognitive functioning. The project concluded in 2013, specifically addressing the length of time police departments should wait before interviewing subjects who had been tased and who tend to suffer substantial declines in cognitive functioning by police officers. Our third panelist is Dr. Michael White, a professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University and the Associate Director of ASU's Center for Violence Prevention and Community Safety. He is the Co-Director of Training and Technical Assistance for the U.S. Department of Justice Body Worn Camera Policy and Implementation Program. Dr. White's primary research interests involve the police, including use of force, technology, and misconduct. He is a co-author of Stop and Frisk, The Use and Abuse of a Controversial Police Tactic, and Jammed Up, as mentioned earlier, Bad Cops, Police Misconduct, and the New York City Police Department. He has commented extensively in the media on police issues, especially on body-worn cameras, and has testified about body-worn cameras before the Presidential Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Dr. White recently completed a multi-site randomized controlled trial testing the impact of police officer body-worn cameras in Tempe, Arizona and Spokane, Washington, and is currently working with the Tempe, Arizona Police Department to design and evaluate a de-escalation training as part of their strategies for policing innovation project. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Thanks, um, Patrick. Thanks for the intro. Thank you for being. Um, you guys can turn your cameras on. It'll be nice to see you all. Um, I, I guess all of this started 
um, in May when, in my estimation, May of 2014, June of 2014. <clears throat> indeed, right. it, it's well, it, indeed. Um, I guess this specific uh, was when George Floyd um, was murdered. Um, and it led me to thinking that we did this five years ago. Uh, five years ago, Dr. Kane, Kane came on the campus and we talked about uh, Michael Brown and we're doing it all over again, this time with George Floyd being the, the flashpoint. Um, so I guess my, my, my initial response is we needed to do this. We had to do this. Uh, we should be talking about these things. But we, we seem to have the same problems now that we had five years ago. And that is that we have an obvious disconnect between police and the communities that they serve. In your estimation, where have we gone wrong? Why are we where we are right now? And it's open to whoever, whoever wants to jump in. You can't be more specific than that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, we, all right, let me start with this question then. Do we have a racist law enforcement community? That's a yes or no question. That's a hard one. That's yes or no. What do you got? Um, so let me go back to your first question. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. Um, and so I think the first thing that comes to my mind, though, is where did we go right? And I don't, I don't think it's an issue that's just been from the last five years. Like if we go back to the Kerner Commission of the 1960s and like time and time again, the same types of problems have been evidenced from a long time in policing history and the same types of recommendations also um, with regard to like generally accountability and things like that. Um, I think in policing though, we've gone right in certain areas when it's particularly pertaining to crime and crime prevention and things like hotspots policing or what have you, right? And we focus so much on trying to prevent crime, I think that maybe to a detriment um, rather than thinking about the ways in which policing mm -hmm. as an organization has harmed communities. And so I think just not focusing on that intentionally throughout the decades um, is kind of where we went wrong, right? And then there's specific manifestations of that that have been evidenced time and time again. Um, but I will kind of start there and then my other panelists can take us further. Yeah, if I, if I could pick up on, on Rob's point about can you be more specific? Um, you know, I, I think that there is a disconnect in many communities between, uh, between police and citizens, but certainly not all. I mean, we've got close to 18,000 police departments in the United States, and many of those police departments have, uh, have very good relationships and long-term positive relationships with their communities, um, black, white, Hispanic. Uh, so it's, you know, I, you know, I, I hesitate to, to use that broad brush and say, yes, there's a disconnect. Uh, certainly there has been, that's very clear. And, you know, as a policing researcher, uh, you know, it's been, both frustrating and, and sad to watch what has happened over the last several months. And it does feel like, well, geez, we just did this in, in 2014. We just did this in 1992. I mean, the, the images from this summer look very similar to, you know, to the images from 1967. So yeah, it's frustrating. But again, I, I like Andrea's point. Let's not just focus on, on what's been wrong in what police have been doing and what police researchers have been doing. Let's, let's also take into account the progress that's been made over the last 50 years, over the last 100 years. And I think it's, it's a lot of progress. Well, so my, I guess to dovetail on both those points, if, if we want to, so Patrick, you know, I was being a smart aleck a little bit to you, but. I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, you know, where did we go wrong for me? Where did we go wrong in policing was that uh, we, we began the, the uh, occupation as an institution that exerts control over other people and that became their primary mandate. The first police forces in the United States in the 1760s were slave patrols in South Carolina and Virginia. You know, so uh, when you ask if we have a racist policing system, I, I mean, I take Mike's point uh, very much, very seriously that there are, there are a lot of really great examples of, of excellent policing across the United States. You don't see them because people don't whip out their phone and record police officers who are actively helping people um, across you know, uh, different 
categories of race and ethnicity and hair color and, and what have you. But, but, the, but the truth is, in, in my view anyway, um, where we went wrong was that we conceived of an institution whose primary um, role in society is to control people. And, um, and we've been dealing with this very Weberian perspective on, on the police institution, that the police are an institution who's, you know, who, who, to whom we've given the general right to use coercive force, but that general right is pretty open-ended. So the, so the bigger question then becomes, if the police exert some racial tendencies and they get their mandate from the public, then where does the racism really start? Mm. Interesting. Uh, I want I want to bounce back for one second, um, only because I, I like the way that Andrea started it with, well, let's take a look at what we've done right. And here's my question. If, if it was conceived poorly, yet we are responsible for the training of police officers, why didn't we just fix it? Why couldn't we change it? Was this something we were simply happy with? Is it something that was necessary? Is it something that we just didn't recognize was problematic? Does that make sense? Right. Well, you're taught. I mean, I, I'll just be. And I'll be quick um, on this one. I, I think that um, you know, it's a difference between tactics and strategies. In in some ways, we we give the police this this mandate. I mean, this goes back to, you know, Peter Manning and even before that, uh, uh, William Wesley in 1950, you know, so we're, we're, we've given the police this mandate to control crime, to reduce crime, to respond when we call them. Mobilizing the police is a, is a <laughs> huge thing in any democratic society. We're asking them to come and bring their coercive authority and their violence, if needed, to solve our problem. I think the problem with police, in some in some ways, is that they forget that they forget that everybody is their client. So they come and they they respond to my problem. Well, I've defined the problem to be that I'm having a conflict with another person, and they want to they come and 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 so you know I've called them. So in a way, I think that they're coming for my sake. And and the thing is, I think we get they get sometimes wrapped up in this issue of of uh, that. I'm here to, to, to stop, I'm here to bring coercion to solve this problem. And I've got a, a person, a reporting party, and I've got a subject. And the subject at this point is not my client, the reporting party is. And I think that's part of where some of this stuff goes off the rails because sometimes, and it's a bigger conversation, but sometimes the police bring, a, bring tactics and they, confuse, they conflate their tactics with strategy. Stop and frisk is a huge one. And, and I just think that, anyway, I'll be quiet and let other folks jump in here. I'd just like to say that Rob is never brief in his comments. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. I try, I do try. Um, so Patrick, you know, my response to you is who's gonna fix it? Uh, you know, with, the tremendous fragmentation in law enforcement in the United States, we can have one chief that comes in in Tucson, Arizona, and decides he's going to fix things there. And in fact, the chief that's in Tucson now is, is doing lots of wonderful things. He just created a Sentinel, uh, Sentinel Events Review Board. He's uh, reaching out to the community on a regular basis. But what Chief Magnus is doing in Tucson has no bearing on what the chief is doing in you know, up the road in Buckeye, Arizona, or in Glendale, or in California, or in, in, sure. in Arkansas. So who's going to impose that? Uh, who's going to impose that change across all of those different police departments? Uh, and Which is why we should federalize them and put them under the U.S. Department of Public Health. But that's a whole other conversation. It's almost I, like, Mike, it's almost like you fe he fed you that so you could feed it back to him. Because my question was going to be, the last thing I saw Rob talk about was federalizing the police, uh, uh, the police forces. Um, so I would actually it, love to go there. Um, let's, go ahead. Let's do it. Well, before I do, I want, I'm gonna, before okay. I go there, um, because I think it's a really interesting point, I want to circle back to the racist question. And so I think nobody wants to be called racist. Nobody wants to call it racist, right? Like it's a touchy word or what have you. But sure. I think it's important when we do talk about it, that we define what we mean by it. And so if I define racism as disparately impacting certain groups of people, right, then then I think the obvious answer is yes. I think if you define racism, you know, if we want to get to motivations or, or explicit and implicit and discrimination, like 
we don't necessarily have the research to support that, right? And so I think it's just really, we have to be clear when we use the term, right? Um, and then be clear about what we mean, because I do think the research is pretty clear about the disparities that exist across the United States in different types of communities and different types of research methods kind of all kind of point to the same, like there are these disparities, right? Um, that said, going to the federalism point, I think it's so fascinating and I would love to maybe um, hear Rob, your, your take on it. Um, but I do think it's so fascinating, this idea of federalism and, and kind of how we've created our democracy I mean, kind of almost the things that we pride ourselves on with regards to lo local power and state power almost come to like bite us on the back end when we think about policing, right? And how decentralized it is with regards to like accountability. Um, and it's something I've thought a lot about. And, you know, I think there's pros and cons to, you know, federal standards and if it's even feasible or maybe the local needs of, of police departments and communities and how you should be responsive. Um, but I think it's an interesting concept. And so I would love to, to hear your thoughts. In two minutes or less, Rob. <laughs> well, it's something I've thought a lot about, okay? And uh, lately in particular. And, and I think, I do feel that that policing is too wrapped up in its coercive mandates. And sometimes I think that coercion becomes both the mandate and the strategy. And, and that's, and again, stop and frisk is a, is a, is a great example, I think is, is the quintessential example of that. And if we, it seems to me, we have a little 10th amendment problem. So that's kind of pesky and difficult to solve. But if the states, to me, if the states were voluntarily, if, this, if states voluntarily gave their authority or signed a memorandum of agreement with the United States and said, hey, let's federalize our police under the U.S. Public Health Service, which is a uniform public health service designed to, you know, essentially um, uh, elevate the standards of public health in the United States, they, that's still under the executive branch. They would still retain their law enforcement functions because that's where the executive, that's where, you know, enforcement is housed, as you probably know. Um, and the U.S. Public Health Service does have an enforcement component to it, so it wouldn't be hard, but there are something like 22 professional divisions in the U.S. Uh, uh, Public Health Service. Policing could be one of them, and then it, we, it, it, I think by, by, by doing something like this, it's radical, and I totally understand. I'm sure Mike's smirking at me a little bit because it sounds so crazy, but the thing is, policing needs a, a mindset change, and, and I think that part of this mindset should be to should be to have them understand that they are part of a health and wellness component of neighborhoods, not just enforcement, because I think that's the enforcement. A little coercion goes a long way. And in, and in challenged neighborhoods, coercion can backfire big time. And so I think we kind of need to move away from that paradigm and move more toward a health and wellness or a protection of life, however you want to describe it and mandate. And I do think that federalization Okay, I'm done, Patrick. Sorry. No, no, that was. I was just gonna say. I, it's. I. You said Mike was smirking at you. He wasn't actually at that point. Wasn't probably other points you've made, but not that one. Um, thoughts, Mike, on on the idea of federalizing uh, our police force. You know, in in principle, it sounds really interesting. I didn't. I don't even know where we'd start. Yeah. Um, and then. You'd have to deal with 50 governors, 50 state legislatures. So, sure. you know, in principle, I think the um, the idea is compelling because what it does is it allows you to centralize all of the the influence and the the power that you would need to impose change, to impose standards for recruitment and selection, for training, for supervision, for um, you know, the use of force, things like that. So in, in principle, I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting idea. Um, you know, maybe is, is there a version of this where each uh, state post board exerts some authority within the state and that's a smaller version yeah. of it? Right, so that's a good point. I, I don't know, because I mean, so if you look to the, Brit the British model, for example, I mean, they, that is a nationalized policing system, even though it's very much rooted uh, operationally at the constabulary level, right? So, so the thing is, I would see, the reason I, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing US Public Health Service is because I think that that's where policing is best nested, not under the, like the Department of Homeland Security. I, I just, I think that we've operated under that paradigm for too long. The thing is, I would see a version of this where they are federalized under US Public Health, service, but then a lot of that authority is like the operational authority is turned back to states. 
um, where they are assigned police officers, you know, based on regional. And it, 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 the interesting thing about it, we're in a pandemic right now, that's why we're all remote. The thing is, imagine the good that policing could accomplish in a pandemic if it were nationalized. It would give the U.S. Public Health Service um, contact tracers automatically. It would give the U.S. Public Health Service the ability to, 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 to engage in public health watching, you know, and helping communities and really understand how to slow the community spread of COVID-19, you know, for example, not just writing tickets and using drones over big events to take pictures of people and write citations and send them to their homes. I mean, I just think that that this moment in history, especially for me anyway, um, makes the point of federalization even more compelling if we think about it in terms of public health. Um, I want to back it out just for a second. You, Rob, you had said uh, public health service versus homeland security. Uh, so I guess in, in that regard, I would you might argue that where it's nested is part of the problem, that where we're coming from, uh, those mandates that are offered is part of the issue. So do we have a do we have a training problem? Do we have a leadership problem? Uh, or, or is it or is there, or is there a third possibility that, that I'm missing altogether? So. I will just respond to your question in just one second, but I think there was a comment that made that was made earlier, and I I think it may have been Robert, but I, I could be wrong here. That said, that maybe um, right, like if police are reflecting larger society and society is racist, right, that then they are just perpetuating it with the difference that they have coercive authority, and so I think that same argument though is applied to public health practitioners. It, it, so it's less about the system, I mean, the, the, the institution itself, and more about this idea that we're in a racist society and anyone who has certain authority can enact those racist um, practices regardless of the institution. And so I wonder if even nesting it within certain a certain house is the solution. I, I, I do think the, the idea of the value of life and protection of life is important. And that culture and that mindset is very different. And so I can agree with that for sure. But I wonder if that answers the racial disparity problem, if we know that there are also racial disparities that exist in public health. Now to get back to the um, training or leadership issue in particular, um, I think the like, my default answer is it's a little bit of both and then some more, right? Um, it's not just one of those and there's a lot of a host of other organizational factors. And I think sometimes I get frustrated when people want a very specific answer, right? They want like, they want a specific answer, they want a specific solution, right? Like body cameras are gonna do it, right? Or like 911 call takers are the solution. And, and it's like really, it's, it's, a, it's so many of these different points that kind of lead to the cumulative effects that we've seen. And I know that's more of a complex answer and it's maybe a cop-out answer, um, but I think it's, it's really the truth of the situation. And, 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 we, and we've heard that for, for months now, that body cameras, and I know that you and Mike both do body camera work, and it was, it would be better if we could see the entire instance, then we would know how to behave, we would know how to react, we would know what the truth was. But the fact of the matter is, for those of us who, who have studied the police for years, that it's, that's still not everything that's happened. I, um, very personally, uh, this summer, I'm from Rochester, New York, and my, uh, my sister is a parole agent and um, a brother-in-law is a tactical officer for the RPD. And he spent the last two months on the street hoping that they weren't gonna burn down the city. Um, they handled everything as far as I could tell perfectly. And all I have is the body camera accounts. Now, from what I can tell, police did everything right, yet we still have a problem. So you know, just uh, to say that even when we give the public what they want with body cameras, it's still not gonna be enough because it's still not gonna be, well, do we have the entire answer? There's still something else going on here. They should have done something differently. Yeah, Rob. So real quick, I'm just gonna make a point and, and I wanna hear, I do wanna hear, I think Mike would have good insights on this one too. Um, you, you said it appears that the police are doing anything right or doing everything right. The thing is this though, Patrick, and this is my view on this stuff, just philosophically, before we ask what the police were do, did on that street corner, it's important to ask why they were on that street corner in the first place. And so to me, it's the broader question of, you know, what was the role of the police during these community, uh, you know, uh, demonstrations, protests? It, it, so, I mean, that's a whole other, probably a whole other evening, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But it's a tricky question, though. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. 
Yeah, I, I mean, the, the debate over body cameras now is interesting because um, there was this expectation they were going to fix everything. I mean, you, you slap cameras on police officers. How is that going to change 50 years of, of antagonism between community members and police officers? I mean, it's right. ridiculous. Um, I remember, you know, there, there was this kind of swell of research that came out early on, on body cameras uh, showing large uh, changes, reductions in use of force and complaints. And, and um, you know, the Obama administration immediately went all in on, on body cameras and thousands of police departments started adopting them. And then October 2017 in Philadelphia at, at the IACP conference, the, uh, the results of the DC Metro body camera study are released and they found no effect and people were in a tizzy. What have we done? How could that be? How, how could, in, in one study we have no effect at all, but in another study we have a 90% reduction in complaints. And it goes back to something Andrea mentioned earlier is, you know, it's the, the local context. I mean, things, you can't expect one thing to fix problem, the same problem in diff, different juris, jurisdictions. The, the problems are, 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 are too different. The people are too different. The communities are too different. different. So, um, you know, it's been a little bit frustrating to be a body camera researcher and then have, have people just kind of say, well, what happened? Why isn't, why are, why haven't we fixed things in five years with these cameras? Well, but we're the researchers, right? We're supposed to have the answers. A number of times, look, my, I, I have, I have changed course a number of times in my career with my studies and my studies have taken me to, to study sex offenders and people want to, want to know why do they do what they do? Because they woke up that way. I, I I don't I don't there's 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 all kinds of answers. And I think for all of us that do research in any in in a in a social science setting, I think it's impossible for us to either to come up with a definitive answer, as Andrea said earlier. You know, everybody wants one answer. There isn't one answer. We're not going to have one answer. But I think us asking simply one question that expects one answer is not the way to do it. Um, I want to go back to this idea of do we, about training versus leadership. Is this um, is, is this a training problem that we have? Do, is, um, because Mike, you're very clear, and I, I think all of us would agree, this is not a, uh, a nationwide problem with every police department, right? We do not have a policing problem throughout the United States, but we do have issues in, in certain departments. Um, is, it, is it a training issue? Is it a leadership issue? Where, how do we get to a point where, you know, in New Orleans, we have to wipe the slate clean and get rid of every every patrol officer because they're all on the take versus um, some departments where you haven't had uh, legitimate complaints in four years because they get along splendidly with the, with the community. What, is, it, is it training? Is it a bad pool of, uh, of applicants? Is it a leadership problem? What is it that's leading us down this road where we time and again seem to see police officers, um, I hate to use the phrase, but police officers behaving badly? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. We, we, we have bad police leaders. I mean, Sheriff Joe Arpaio at, at MCSO, he was running again this year to be sheriff and uh, thankfully did not win. But uh, here's here, you know, he, he ran that organization uh, in a way that was uh, racially discriminatory at all levels. And he was enormously popular. You look at, you know, the chief in Ferguson in, in, in 2014, if you read that, um, that civil rights division uh, investigation report, uh, you wonder how that happens. So there, clearly leadership is, is part of the problem. Um, you know, I think training is an issue too. Uh, you know, most of the training that, that officers receive have very little to do with what they're actually gonna be doing day to day on the street. You know, look at the standard curriculum uh, for a training academy and how much time is devoted to um, you know, dealing with someone who has substance abuse issues or someone who's mentally ill and in crisis, yet um, they handle those kinds of, of uh, incidents much more than the kind that are making the news where force is going to be used. But if you look at the, the proportion of the curriculum that's devoted to use of force and uh, defensive tactics, it's, it's disproportionate. So there's a, there's a training problem too. Uh, and as Andrea said earlier, there's also a host of other issues that are, that are in the mix. Rob, thoughts? Yeah. Training, leadership? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's, I, my, I mean, you know, Mike hit it on the head. I think that our police are actually trained um, incredibly well in terms of their field tactics. Um, uh, they are some of the best in the world, to, to be 
honest with you. I mean, they, you know, then they, and police from big agencies in the U.S. travel all over the world and put on um, trainings. So tactically, our police are, 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 are quite excellent. You want a building cleared? <laughs> Call an American police department. You know, you want a felony stop? Call an American police department. But uh, you want a police officer who doesn't force a conflict, who, um, you know, who uh, understands that sometimes a person just needs a chair to sit down in and to, and to chill for a minute and they don't have to be thrown to the ground uh, because controlling people isn't always the thing, first thing you have to do. I mean, that's, I think that's where the leadership piece comes in and, and, um, and, and, you know, the other thing and the incentive, I mean, you know, think about it too, too, their incentive, you know, there, there, there are two things going on in police agencies that, that incentivize police to do what they do on the street. Uh, one of them, of course, is the performance evaluations. And, and while most, you know, most of the performance evaluation is around following practice, following, um, uh, the operational, operational manual and procedures, there's a big piece of it that, that also evaluates officers on, on how many arrests they made, how many citations they write. And then there's the informal reward system, which is you're an aggressive. I mean, if I have to, I, I work with multiple police agencies right now. I have a really good relationship with one. I'm, I'm currently doing a very interesting RCT with, and even they sometimes say things that I just shake my head. You know, we have this really aggressive cop and he's, 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 he's does, he does great because he makes so many arrests, blah, blah, blah. Like that's the, that's the reward system. In an, in an organization like that. And so right. that's, it's the informal stuff too. That's so when you say leadership, it's the, it's the formal structure, definitely the informal reward system. And then Andrea should jump in here, but I just want to say unions as well. Unions in many cities and many states make it almost impossible to hold individual police officers accountable. Plenty of police chiefs would love to fire uh, uh, problematic police officers, but they get sued by the union and you've got this cop who's there engaging in what is obviously bad, bad policing and still on the street. And um, so I don't even know what to do about that. Yeah. Andrea, thoughts on training versus, because I, because I, I want to piggyback on something that you had mentioned about racial disparity, but I want to give you a chance to answer this one. Yeah, no, I agree with um, kind of everything both of um, Mike and Rob both said. Um, I guess the only thing I would just um, add building off of that last point that blows my mind at least is just like we built an entire criminal justice system around the idea that deterrence um, matters and that punishment is a way to deter crime right and the fact that we don't apply the same principles if that's what we believe is really important for crime why we don't apply, apply those principles to holding officers accountable when they violate rules just like I just don't understand. Um, and so I do think accountability really matters and the lack of it also kind of serves to further perpetuate that. But um, I will stop there. I agree, I agree. Um, we, had, we have a uh, question that came in um, from the audience. The question is with tremendous uh, income inequalities between African-American neighborhoods um, with those of other groups, can policing ever be just and balanced? And I think that that's, it's a really good question to sort of, uh, to jump a, a little bit into this idea of racial inequality. Is it possible for us to have just and balanced and do we police the same um, for people of color as we do for European Americans? Uh, is, that, is that something that we're doing? Do we see that there's a difference? Andrea, you had started with, we've got racial disparities up and down the system. Uh, William Wilbanks might argue, he would claim that we, it's a myth that we don't have a, 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 a racist criminal justice system. He said that 25, 30 years ago. Um, I don't know how you look at our system and don't see the racial disparity across the board. Uh, he seemingly he did. And I guess my question is, can't, can we be just, can we be fair and balanced? Can we have the same for the community um, largely made up of people of color versus uh, a community made uh, largely made up of whites? Is it, is that, is it feasible? Is it possible? I do think income inequality really does matter. And I think that there is um, definitely research to suggest like some of the correlates of crime, not all of them, but some of them have to do with poverty and uh, unemployment and things like that. And so I think that that's a really important point and it's an important point for us to think about how we address the root causes of crime in the first place and about those income inequality differences. Um, that said, I think, um, 
there's a, a recent book that, that came out by Elliot Curry, um, and I'm, the name is slipping my mind, but it came out this year, and there was a review that I was just reading about it, where he kind of goes into these differences with income inequality and looking at, like, looking at some of the research that looked at um, historically kind of disadvantaged white communities and, and how crime rates were in those communities compared to um, African-American communities and compared police treatment and things like that. And even then there are still differences um, between, between those types of communities. And so while I think income inequality is important, um, it doesn't necessarily take away from the racial differences. It may explain some of it, but it doesn't kind of absolve all of them. Um, and so it's important to kind of think about those differences also. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, my, my view on this too is that, uh, I mean, structural inequality um, or structural disadvantage, let's call it, um, explains everything to be, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it explains crime, um, it explains health disparities, um, uh, it explains diabetes, uh, it explains asthma in kids, you know, I mean, pretty much you look at a neighborhood, William Julius Wilson, I saw this, I mean, when I was an undergrad, okay, I saw him, a very younger version of him and me, um, I saw him on this interview thing, you know, and, uh, and he said, I could look, I could put my finger on a zip code, they were using zip codes back then, that's how long ago this is, I could, I could put my finger on a zip code in Chicago and tell you what the life chances are of a, of a kid who lives there um, based on the level of disadvantage, structural disadvantage. And that's, you know, the thing is that level of disadvantage explains, it explains um, crime, but it also explains your likelihood of getting shot by the police because those are also the neighborhoods where the police come in and, and they, they, they are in many cases, highly aggressive in these neighborhoods. I don't think we need, I don't really think we should dance around this. I think we need to be upfront about this, that the police are hard on, 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 on highly structurally disadvantaged communities. And these are communities of color for the most part, because it's very difficult to disentangle uh, percent, you know, non-white population or percent black population from, from the disadvantage in, in many cities. So we have a racially segregated urban America. There is no doubt about that. And the police are getting rewarded in their departments for going in doing drug sweeps, pulling kids off the corner. And it's, it's a very complicated, I don't even remember what the question was. And it, it is, you talk about the, 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 this race and economics are bound up in this together and it's almost impossible. And the other thing too, I'm gonna to say something that you might not like and, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe your audience won't like it either. But the thing is a lot of, of, of white people, white cops, you know, we wanna, we, we're they're friendly with people of color uh, while they're behaving. And then the moment they don't behave the way we want them to, uh, the N word comes out sometimes. And that's, it's like this thing that, that a lot of folks carry around in their back pocket. And um, it's, it's just, it's, it's sort of ever present. It's like the, the statute, the, the Confederate statutes built in the 1950s in the South. That, that wasn't a tribute so much as it, as it was a dog whistle. So, you know, I think we need to be upfront about this stuff sometimes. Mike, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, to pick up on, on Rob's point about how hard police can be on, uh, on poor minority communities. I think how stop and frisk went off the rails in New York City is a really good example. If you look at, at how that tactic was, was employed and, and disproportionately employed uh, in communities of color, that, that's a great example. But the, you know, the, the original question, can policing ever be just and balanced? I, I say yes. I, I think there are probably thousands of examples of that every single day. Uh, if you look at the encounter level, uh, and and many of those encounters occur in in minority communities between white police officers and and minority citizens. So, um, I, I refuse to accept the, you know, the answer no to that question that police can ever be, uh, that it can't be just and balanced. I think it is. I think we've got problems, um, and and we we mostly know what those problems are. Now we just have to figure out the best way to to move forward. But. Um, yeah, to say no, that policing can never be just, it can never be balanced, and then what? We scrap the whole thing? Uh, hmm. I don't buy that. Well, I, I think that Mike's a spot on, to be honest with you. I mean, I th the reason I study the police is because I actually think that they can emerge as among the most important public institutions 
uh, in America uh, for precisely, but you know, Michael Banton published a book in 1964, Pol The Policeman in the Community. And what he said was the police are inherently good and they are inherently dangerous. And no sentence has ever been more true of the police, I think, in, in, in policing history. He was writing about the British police, of course, but, but that they are, they, are, they are intrinsically good, but they are intrinsically dangerous. And we, we've seen now in the last, well, we've seen really throughout the history of policing, we've seen the degree to which they can be dangerous. They can be good. And, and I, I'm with Mike on, on this, that it's, it, just, it, takes, it takes a lot, it's gonna take a lot, it's gonna take a lot of reframing and America is going to want to have to make our police good, okay? Not, uh, not well, good. So, that's but the idea. problem that we have is that in America, uh, America, the majority of Americans are not people of color, and if you ask the majority of Americans, they would say police officers are doing what we ask them to do. The problem is, it is the the. The problem is that Eric Garner was black and Michael Brown was black and George Floyd was black. And seemingly this is not happening to whites in America. And it's, it's only happening to people of color. Why is it that that's what we're seeing then? So I, I, I would agree with you that is, is it possible to be just and fair and yes. But I also agree with, with the point that Americans are gonna want to do this and there's just no chance of that happening because the vast majority of Americans don't see the problem, but that doesn't mean there's not a problem. Right, right? a lot of our, 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 a lot of our policing scholars, some that who trained you, Patrick, um, would, would argue that, that, um, that policing does have to change from within. And maybe sure. I'm not sure, Mike, where you, what you, how, where you come down. It takes a lot of courage for a police chief to try to, to try to make, changes but again you and i hate you know you get into problems of unionization in many cases in, in in a lot of big city police departments in the united states police commissioners are only allowed to bring in maybe three deputy commissioners who are not in civil service right all the everybody else in the department is civil service and so you can't come in as a reform police commissioner with only three people who have your back when you implement accountability standards and practices it's because everybody else in that organization who doesn't want to change they will drag their feet and you're going to leave there unsuccessful mm -hmm. so uh, the unions this is a big it's not something to just gloss over it's a big deal and, and i'm maybe i'm going to get a lot of hate mail tomorrow but it's a it's a big impediment to police accountability so i struggle with this question actually and so i interpreted the question a little bit differently though i think my interpretation of the question from albert is if we don't deal with the societal differences can then we ever expect policing to to be better and so i do think it, it takes dealing with some of the societal kind of correlates in order for for also for us to kind of bring policing up to the expectations that we want it to be i, I think they go hand in hand um that said like i do often question my own self of like injury like do you think you know like that's why I do this work though like I haven't stopped studying policing reforms yet at least right I mean maybe in 10 years I'll have a different opinion um but I do think it's something to at least still aspire to but I don't think it will look anything like policing today I think it it kind of goes back to kind of Robert's points in the beginning about kind of rethinking you know why police are, are responding in certain places or what it means to use coercive authority um and how we think about protecting lives I think that can still be labeled policing, but it's very different than what we have today. Yeah, I, one thing I would add, uh, and, and this takes it back to leadership, you know, there's an old kind of saying that the culture eats policy for breakfast, meaning whatever the informal culture is, that's what's gonna rule the day. I think we need to get to the point where, uh, where leadership eats culture. And Rob's points about the, the, the limits that a chief, a reform chief has to face when coming into an organization are, you know, they can be, uh, they can be pretty tough to overcome. Um, but, you know, for me, this, this summer felt different. Um, it felt different than the summer of 2014. And, and in the past, I've been doing this for a while. Um, you know, you think about the, you know, the, um, the protests that have happened uh, you think about, you know, what the professional athletes have done this summer in terms of, um, you know, boycotting games. You think about the fact that there's legislation at the, at the local, the state, and the federal level to reform the police. 
there's movement within the, the police profession to reform. If you look at some of the stuff that's being put out by IACP in terms of community engagement, I think, I think this summer feels different. I think we're, you know, we have hit a tipping point and we're, we're at a point where we can maybe uh, empower reform chiefs to, to be strong enough to, to eat culture. And can I just add one thing, Patrick? Yeah, please, please. Also, I think people of color are not the majority yet. But the way the demographic trends are going, <laughs> I do think, right, like when we think about the way the U.S. Is, is kind of trending towards and how Latinx populations are just growing, you know, like I can imagine a very different United States as well. Um, so. Which yeah. might not be the worst thing in the world. Right. I, I mean, that's change is good as far as I can tell. Um, I, why is it that every person that we see die at the, and I, and I, yes, I'm exaggerating. It's not every person. So I'm going to apologize because Rob's going to say, well, Patrick, it's not every person. You're right. But why, why is it you, seemingly, what's that? Why, why you? Why you? Uh, because, because you'd be the first one to take the shot at me. So my, here's my, so here's my, why, why, why is it seemingly always a black man? Now? Yes, we've got Breonna Taylor. Um, uh, but why is it seemingly a black man consistently dying at the hands of a police officer what is this you know if rob had said we, the social inequality maybe that's is the key is this are police officers racist is it a racist view is this how they're trained is is it is it fear is is that playing into play? why is it that this is continually happening and the pattern looks amazingly similar every time what would justify shooting a man seven times in the back? I don't care what he's reaching into the back seat for. Seven times in his, uh, we all know that wasn't part of the training manual. So why, why is it that this is continually happening in, in your opinion? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I guess to an extent, I, I guess what we're seeing on on the videos is that this is probably the tip of the iceberg and you know we're seeing these high profile um, deaths of people of color black, black men mostly uh, they are filmed out there in the public I mean the you know the thing is uh, everybody's got a phone now and so that's you know you turn it on but the thing is I, I, so I think it's partly a function of where the police are mostly deployed okay. um, so I think that's a piece of it. It's like this opportunity structure. It's a hazard model, basically. The more opportunity there is, the more the, the you know the more they're called, the more there the, the opportunity exists to to use these highly coercive interventions. Um, Derek Chauvin did not seem too fearful of George Floyd to me on that tape or in that video. I mean, uh, so I think we can take that off the table. Um, and I think, though, that to be honest, I think what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. I think that the that it's that we're thinking we look at this as as a death in custody or a death at police hands as as these are enormously traumatic events. And I think Mike is spot on when he says that 2020 feels different because it, it did feel different. And, and um, I mean, that was like 1967, 1968, all over again in terms of the number of cities. Uh, that experienced these just outraged protests, okay? But I think what this really speaks to is people, you know, a police department, police officer can, can shoot uh, a, anybody or a person of color can kill somebody. And, and nine times out of 10, they, people wouldn't riot about it and tear down the city unless they were already operating at their their margins of elasticity, their margins of tolerance for being abused on a daily basis. And I think that's really what, what we're seeing. George Floyd, horrible. I, I, the word it's, you know, I don't know how many adjectives can we use to describe how awful that was, but that was just the visible uh, manifestation, the, the most extreme version. Think about all of the daily hassles the people of color in those communities are dealing with and having to deal with on a daily uh, basis. And I think that's what's going on here. So, so Rob, you would argue then this, this isn't simply about the problems they're dealing with on a daily basis with police, but simply life. 
that these this is the social inequality this is the uh, economic inequality well, this is well, i mean it's it's totality. So it, yeah if you think i mean andrea kind of uh, uh approached this a little while ago you know when she was talking about the u.s public you know or the public health and racial disparities and in, in, in public health issues the thing is a lot of people i mean it's like the legal marginalization stuff that rob sampson wrote about in the 80s maybe i think you need 89 um and it's it's I think these are neighborhoods and these are neighborhoods of color for the most part who, you know, feel as though they're being mistreated by virtually all of their okay. public institutions. OK, the police are particularly problematic because of the coercion they wield. You know, the, the, the garbage company that doesn't pick up your trash for a few days, you're pretty annoyed by that. But, you know, I don't think it's going to cause a riot uh, necessarily. Um, it's so, so I think it's a really a big combo of events. Okay. Mike, Andrea, what do you think? Mike? Yeah, I mean, to pick up on, on Rob's point, you know, there, there are about approximately 50 million police citizen encounters every year. And if, if the Washington Post data, which I think is probably among the best data we have, if, if those data are, are good, that there are about a thousand people who are killed each year by the police, yeah. do that math. Um, you know, I think Rob's point is is well taken. You know, it's what's happening in those other encounters that are, um, you know, the daily hassles, the uh, the you know the verbal abuse, those kinds of things that are are pushing pushing people to to the edge. So when there is that shooting, um, which is extraordinarily rare, that a police officer is going to uh, is going to shoot at somebody and kill that person, extraordinarily rare. But when people are at their limit already because of the daily mistreatment of police, that's when things boil over, uh, which, which means, you know, we should think about every single police citizen encounter as an opportunity to improve the relationship of the police and the community, um, to, to build legitimacy, to, you know, uh, if you think about it in those terms, then when that shooting does happen, if there's a lot of legitimacy in the bank uh, because of all the good work that's been done, then maybe it won't boil over because people are not uh, kind of at their uh, at their breaking point. Is is that why would would that be a, a prominent reason for getting rid of stop and frisk altogether? I mean, we we see we we seemingly have stop and frisk that's being utilized, and it's unilaterally against African-Americans. Stop, stop and men. frisk. Stop and frisk as a crime control strategy is a disaster and it's illegal. Yes. Okay. Uh, stop and frisk as an officer safety tactic never goes away. You, you, we, I mean, the court was very clear in Terry versus Ohio about the, uh, on both the, the limits of stop and frisk, but on the utility. It can't. So, I mean, a pat down of a person's outer clothing because they, they might appear dangerous. To, I don't see how that goes away. And I don't know that I would want it to go away. I'm the son of a cop. <laughs> I mean, maybe that makes me a son of a bitch. I don't know, but I'm but I'm the son of a sorry. You I beat us to it, Rob. <laughs> yeah, right. I have to. But you know, the thing is, you know, my dad was out working every night. I'm glad stop and frisk was a thing because I wouldn't want him or anybody I know facing a, a weapon when they don't know it. So so that doesn't go away. It's, it's the strategy, and that's what I talked about earlier about how the tactics and strategies, the coercion tactics and strategies. Sometimes it conflated with one another. As a as a strategy, bad bad idea. As a tactic, important. Okay. Andrea, thoughts? Yeah, um, there's so many other. there's so many things that they brought up that I'm just like, wh where do I want to go in? And so I agree um, for the most part. I, I picking up on the the kind of building legitimacy bank. Like research on trust building generally talks about how. It's like the little marbles each time that make trust kind of what it is. It's not about these big grand moments. So it's not that like we held this one officer accountable, although we should. It's really about these little moments each and every step of the way that really makes for improved trusting relationships. And so I couldn't agree more with that last point about thinking about the daily interactions, right? Not just preventing the, the officer shooting, um, for instance. But I think thinking about your original question, um, around the black man, right? And I, I do think that there, 
it, it's, it's, that is a bigger issue than policing specifically, right? When we think about media, when we think about news, when we think about who's aggressive, when we think about like what we all are, our psychological biases about like what the mugshot looks like, right? I think it would be problematic to not acknowledge that, right? But I think even then, um, I, I couldn't agree more with kind of the sentiments around like what neighborhoods are over policed. And for the most part, I think most criminologists, I'm sure probably we could all agree in working in communities of color in particular, they want police services. They don't, they want to be protected from crime, right? It's not that they want like to, to not have, like to, to be subject to crime. It's that they don't want the abuse and, and everything else that may come with, with kind of police enforcement, right? Um, and so I think it's a fine line of, of when we're thinking about what the right strategy is, right? Where people still feel protected um, by whatever agency is supposed to be protecting them without feeling also that they're going to be abused or discriminated against. Sure, that's a good point. We, um, so we're at about the time when the audience really starts to grab a hold of what we're talking about. And we've gotten a couple of questions that very much are, I wouldn't normally cut here because I have a couple of that I would like to ask, but they're public health related. And so I, I kind of, I want to kind of throw them out there. Maria asks, public health principles tell us to go upstream and find the root cause. Should the band-aids that we have talked about in terms of fixing the police be replaced with empowering communities to eliminate inequities uh, which changes the way that police may perceive the community. Is that feasible? Is it possible? Is it something that we can do? I, I mean, I, I, for me, that's exactly the point of all of this stuff. I mean, I think that um, a lot of our answers to these big moments of, of police abuse of authority you know, deadly force encounters, death in custody. Uh, I think that a lot of our answers revolve around trying to control coercion and trying to create these accountability standards. And to me, that's very downstream. Uh, it, it seems that a more upstream approach would be to rethink, I mean, really just rethink the police role, but also rethink the way we recruit the way we screen. We have a screening out paradigm right now. That's how we get police officers. It's, you know, 500 people apply and then the person or the people who make it are the people who, uh, who, who didn't fail <laughs> because, the, because the, the screening process didn't like them. That's the wrong way to do this. We need to have a screening in process where we actually go find people we want and bring them in because they possess the qualities that we want to you know, see flourish in police organizations. That's just one of these little things, you know, it's like a little, it's, it's the way we started in policing and it's just wrong. You know, it's, it's uh, the command and control stru structures of police departments. Uh, they're, they're, they're quasi military at the very top, but you know, as you get down closer and closer to, to the street uh, level, the, you have these informal encounters with people that, that aren't covered by the paramilitary model. So we need to give police officers better structured uh, discretion and, and better ideas about how to manage human beings at the, at the encounter level beyond just thinking about, about the coercion and how you control coercion. It's got to be more than that. There's two downstream. We've got to go way upstream because they don't need to focus on all these little accountability. And I'll say one more thing, I, that, that report on 21st century policing that Ramsey and his group uh, published, you read that thing, it's just more of the same. It's, it's, it, there's nothing, and you know, nothing's been implemented by the way, it, from that report. It's all about, you know, how to make police more accountable and how to, you know, we're gonna eliminate the carotid chokehold and, and et cetera, et cetera, which didn't happen. And so that was a very, that report, from my view as a police scholar, very disappointing because it was virtually all downstream with little, little things about we need to change the re recruitment paradigm. And to me, it was just kind of not a great thing. So, so yeah, upstream is the way to go. Andrew, Mike, thoughts on this public health issue? Yeah, I think we're seeing a couple of examples of, of uh, large cities taking a portion of the police budget and, and moving it out and moving it somewhere else, presumably to um, you know, another agency that's gonna be able to take on some of those responsibilities that are not involving crime. It's happened in LA, it happened in New York, a couple other places. Um, you know, for me, the, 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 the defund the police thing, I, I, you know, 
what does that mean? Uh, for most people, when they, they say that and they support that, they're not talking about abolition. They're not talking about getting rid of the police. Uh, there are folks who, who believe that and, and offline, I'll tell you what I think about those folks. But, <laughs> um, you know, for me, really defunding the police is about shrinking the mission. And this gets to some of the things both Andrea and Rob have been talking about. Um, you know, taking away some of the things that have fallen to the police just because there's been no one else to handle them. Uh, who else is available 24-7, 365 and can get there quickly? And oh, by the way, there might be the, the, uh, the need for coercive force, so it's a good thing they're there. Um, so it's possible. You know, I, I wonder uh, if we start sending social workers and nurses and, and other folks to uh, suicide calls and, and mental health crisis calls, how quickly will one of those folks be injured or killed and what is that going to do? Um, so yeah, I, I think that there's a lot to this, what I call shrink the mission, not defund. So shrink the mission that, that has value, uh, but we'll see how it plays out because right now there, there aren't a, a whole lot of options for um, you know alternatives to the police to handle some of these non-crime problems. Mm -hmm. I would just add, I agree that there are definitely some models in place um, and some health based models for like curing violence and all of that. But I think getting to the point of the question about like, should communities try to like work on eliminating those inequities in the first place? Like to me, if we could take a substantial pot of money and invest it in the root causes of, of crime, right? Like structural disadvantage and things like that. I'm not sure anyone like let's put the policing argument aside like let's just talk about investing in community health and well-being and and inequality and reducing that like i think most people would agree that that is what creates a healthy and vibrant community and then hopefully the offshoot of that would just be less reliance on a criminal justice system overall because hopefully there's less crime right um and so i think that is definitely a long-term strategy which then becomes kind of the problem of like we still have problems today right and that's more thinking about the future um but if we would have done that 50 years ago we would have been reaping the benefits today right and so i definitely think um that is is something that we should be thinking about in tandem with all of these other reform strategies is this just one more thing that one of these politicians is going to throw on our face before november 3rd though andrea is this one of those things where somebody says look, he wants to take a whole bunch of money from the police and uh, give it to neighborhoods because that's so they can do whatever they want with it, right? Th it feels like this, th this is going to become an ad that I'm going to have to watch unless, it, I mean, my 14-year-old son You only says, have 13 more days. Yeah, well, look, my 14-year-old son says, Dad, I can't watch one more commercial. He's 14 and he's already had enough of it. And I'm like, how do you think we feel? So we're voting. And, uh, but is that one of those things where, Okay, well then, where are we going to get the money from? Who are we going to? Who are we going to? Do we do exactly what Mike says? Is uh, take some of that money that seemingly is I don't want to say being wasted, Mike. I, you, you used it the, the term you used it to um, what was it about the mission to shrink the mission, shrink the mission to shrink the mission, right? So I, I think at that point, is this something that we would all get behind? We see in, you know, in this room, we're an educated group of people. I think all of us would say, yes, that, yeah. a great idea, right? Well, but I don't know it, about that. No, I don't know if I would, I don't, I don't know if I, if I, if I would say shrink the mission. I think that, I think that uh, policing, I think we need to step back a little bit and ask ourselves, what is policing? Policing is a public good. Okay. Policing is paid for by all of us. So if it's a public good, then we should distribute policing in ways that enhance uh, public wellness. And yes, the, the thing about that's tricky here is it, for the exact reason Mike mentioned a, a few minutes ago, um, you know, that, that you're gonna have the, we, we're always gonna live, ah, I mean, we're always going to need a, a, an institution, unless we have like just five people living on our island, anytime you get more than five people living on your island, you're going to need at some point an institution to come to you with the general right to use coercive force because something's gonna go wrong, okay? But here's what I, here's what I would say about that. Number one, let's remember policing is a public good and so the public should decide how to distribute policing services. And, and so that's one thing. And maybe the mission is the mission. Maybe, maybe we need to expand the mission to meet public need at this moment, okay? The, the second piece is that just because coercion is a defining feature of the police doesn't mean 
that every police public encounter has to be defined by coercion. Okay, so that, so my point on this is that yeah, we have a lot of need for policing services, not the kind we're getting necessarily right now all the, all the time, but we have a need for agency for some public agency to to come into neighborhoods and and contribute on uh, to the to the common good. Some of that means law enforcement. Some of that means some degree of order maintenance, but some of it means health and wellness as well. And I think that's where, and so maybe the mission expands until we get some public private partnerships where some private money starts to get funneled into these neighborhoods because they become seen as good investments. And, and over time, you've got the, you, you have a workforce that, it, that becomes ready to, to take on, you know, working at Wegmans and Costco, where these are really good jobs for folks. Those are good companies. And so maybe that's, you know, part of this has to be a conversation about private investments and giving some kind of incentives for private, for good private companies, not predatory private companies, but good ones to come in and employ people. Because then over time, you can decrease the need. You start, you, you shift the mission maybe of the police. So it's, it's, I guess it's, I'm saying it's complicated. All right. The back end was fine, but you, you just said the public good, because it's a public good, the, the public should decide how to distribute police resources. You believe that? Because the public has well, no idea what goes into policing. No, and I don't think there's any of us, and if there's any of us in this room who would argue against that, I, I would I would challenge. No, right? the public in your neighborhood knows nothing about policing. The public in neighborhoods in Southeast Washington, DC, North Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia, they know a lot about policing and they're gonna have a lot to say about it. So they are the public too. And they are the, 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 the folks and the communities who are having the will of the police imposed on them in right. many cases. So absolutely, it, the, the public needs a voice in how policing services are distributed. I completely agree. I think there's a technical aspect of like, yes, we don't, maybe there's people who are uh, less educated about the actual breakdown and the line items and the budgets on, I mean, I think that's a fair argument, but I completely agree that the public should have a voice. I guess my, the thing that I, I think about in terms of practice, when we think about voting turnout, like how does that public voice get wielded? Who shows up to the community meetings rather than like police or com city commissioners waiting for certain people who are more involved to come in, right? Like that looks like actually going out to the people who are, who are the most um, kind of maybe d disenfranchised, if you will, if we think about voting rights and kind of the downstream effects of the criminal justice system too, means that certain people have less of a voice, right? And so I think just being intentional that like all publics matter. And I think I'm sure, you know, that's, I don't think, I think that's probably what you meant, Robert. Um, but I think just kind of saying that is really important too, um, because then it's, right, the public had a voice on tough on crime legislation, right? Like we, p politicians said, let's do tough on crime and everyone voted and supported, right? Um, and, and then kind of here we are, right? Um, and so I think that we need to be careful, I think, of how we think about the public too. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, definitely. Mike, thoughts? I mean, isn't, isn't this what community policing is? You know, community policing, the community and the police are co-producers of public safety. Uh, but community policing turns out it works well in, um, you know, communities that are um, not impoverished, that, that um, you know, that there's a, plenty of resources in communities where there is um, antagonism between police and citizens, where uh, unemployment is high, where uh, crime is prevalent, it turns out community policing is much more difficult to implement there. Um, so, and, and there are a variety of reasons why that is, but one of them I think is that sometimes the community just doesn't wanna have anything to do with the cops. Uh, and, and a lot of that may be because there's this long history of, of that daily mistreatment by police. So uh, I agree that the community should have a say in this. There's no question about that. Um, how best to do that? I don't know. My, my response to the community policing issue, though, is that Robert Janowitz wrote in 1982 that community policing is a philosophy, that, that this should be a philosophy that, that uh, permeates the entire department. So the co-production of safety stuff, you know, from, from Skolnick's 1990 uh, work is, is, is excellent work, and, but the 
But the thing is, community policing in most police departments has been relegated to a special unit in the police organization. And to me, that's the that's the and that the reason for that is because we've got 150 years of coercion and control and quasi-military bureaucratic organization that was not going to have community policing being infused throughout the organization. So it's it's uh, it's like yeah, it's very tough, but. But community policing is the is the parable, frankly, for me, for for where we are in policing and how difficult it is to change the philosophical aspects of policing. Because look at it, it started out as a philosophy, at least from the philosophers, and and became a special unit. So there you have it. So no more important than our canine unit or our SWAT teams or. They go into neighborhoods that that um, you know they're. I mean, they're, yeah, it's a tough question to answer. They go into neighborhoods that you know the bicycle community. They're going to be bicycle cops. They're going to work, and they're going to tell you they have great relationships with the with the community there, and, and maybe they do, um, but they're they're not in the most challenged settings of a city for the most part. Do, do we think, and we've had a couple of people ask this question, um, do we think that if, if we're following the uh, public health model, and I think Mike uh, started to answer this um, briefly, uh, that social workers have a place in policing, that uh, we should, and again, I want to go, I want to go back to Rochester, New York. Daniel Prude was, had PCP coursing through his veins, uh, and it, we, we may have been better served having a social worker rather than six cops surrounding him. What, what's a social um, worker going to do? That, that's, that's my question. And, and that's, do, do, we, do we, first of all, attach them to police agencies? And two, do we bring them when we have possible mental health concerns um, on, a, on, a, on a call? Is there, is there any validity to this whatsoever? I mean, the thing is, cops go up to a 911 call, you know, I mean, it, these are situations that can unfold quickly. I don't know if you want a social worker standing next to you, because uh, I'm not really sure what they bring to that, except that now you've got to worry about protecting that person um, as well. I mean, I think that I, so my, and, you know, obviously, Andrea and Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because I have thought about this quite a bit. A lot of police departments are bringing social work, they're, they're creating these I'm doing a, I'm starting a randomized controlled trial with the SEPTA police in Philadelphia on this very thing, this idea of bringing social workers to deal with, um, you know, people who are homeless in subway stations. The thing is, um, from what I've seen, I'm not sure they're bringing a lot to, to, to the encounters, to be honest with you. I think that, that, that if police just generally better connect with public health nursing, for example, some social work stuff, then maybe, you know, you get these other professionals in. And, and, and that's why I think that if we start thinking about the police as part of the community wellness system in a, in a neighborhood, then they have out, they can immediately link to public. I think public health nursing has the greatest, I mean, first of all, they're the most trusted profession like in the country. Uh, and, and David's old, David Old's models of the police, uh, of the, um, uh, uh, family nurse partnerships um, have have shown that you know nursing in the home can change life outcomes in ways that are that are just incredible. So you want to partner the police with with folks. Uh, to me, nursing is the best um, the best work you know, profession. So I think um, from a mental health standpoint, that mental health professionals are key. I, I don't think that like if, if you're responding to an emotionally disturbed person or someone who's off like I do think yes there are times where that could get violent um, but even then though like having someone who is trained as a mental health expert is, is just a very different type of service that is really beneficial and I think one of the few trainings that besides procedural justice training crisis intervention training has uh, some promising results with regards to like even for law enforcement officers right knowing thinking about de-escalation and how to identify what someone who is dealing with a mental illness is and versus like whether that's violent or not and so I think um, generally mental health professionals could, could bring something 
I think though, I would push back a little bit on the question. Um, I think the, the question that Robert kind of posed back of like, what does a social worker bring and say, what does a police officer bring, right? And so like, do we even need the, the armed response in the first place? I think there are definitely clear situations when yes, it's needed. But I think there are other situations where I'm not sure if an armed person is the best to deal with it. It's just become the de facto. And I think that was maybe the point Mike was getting at in, in the first place. And so I don't know if it's more so of like, do we need to pair people up or like, can we actually say that like, no, these are different services and different functions. And it's okay if it's not a 911 officer showing up. Um, maybe there are very clear cases where someone else can show up. Um, but again, I do think it's like a fine line of trying to differentiate what those cases are to make sure that there's not like a additional harm posed on the person who is not prepared for it. You know, and in some cases, you know, the police are, are, are there because they can get there quickly and getting there quickly is a matter of life and death. I'm, I'm working with the Tempe Police Department on a project. Um, six months ago, they were all trained in how, how to um, administer Narcan uh, because they didn't have it. And there were just almost, you know, weekly cases where a police officer would get to a scene, there would be an opioid overdose, They'd be doing chest compressions. The person would be turning blue, not breathing and dying, and they couldn't do anything about it until fire got there with the Narcan. So now the, now police uh, in Tempe have Narcan. And I get emails now almost every day of a Tempe police officer arriving to an overdose. The person is dead. They are not breathing. Heart's not pumping. They administer Narcan. And the person, the, you know, the overdose uh, effects are reversed and the person is brought back to life. And that happens because the cops can get there faster than the fire department and medics and just about anyone else. So I think there's a piece of this that, um, that is not going to go away. And I'll tell you what, when I, when I talked to the cops in Temp Tempe about this, uh, I talked to them before this project started uh, and I thought they were going to hate this, um, this idea of now being responsible for dealing with people who are overdosing. But before they even started carrying it, they, they were, uh, enthusiastic about it because there were enough of them that had just stood there and watched somebody die because they didn't have, you know, the medication to save a life. I don't yeah, think I think that, that didn't answer any questions, but I wanted to talk about that project. So, you know what though, that, but you brought up a great point though, and, and believe it or not. And, um, Oh, I believe uh, it. That, <laughs> you, you brought up a great point, which is, which is that there is no other and so Andrea, this is partly to you too. There is no other public agency that's out there driving around randomly in, you know, with a directed patrol function, preventive patrol. There's no other public agency that's taking emergency calls that are already in the in the in the community. Okay. And so that's one of the reasons that that's one of the things that makes the police intrinsically good is that they can get someplace. They need to be armed, in my view, because that toothpaste is out of the tube. We have so many guns in this country that I, I don't, I can't even think about a police force that's not armed. It just doesn't compute with me. So I think they need to be armed. And so when they show up, they're going to be armed. But maybe policing in the sense that we're thinking about it in terms of the coercive response isn't uh, the, best, uh, the best way to do it. You know, a mental health person, a professional, of course, you know, I totally agree with you on that one. Um, but the, Mike's Narcan story, I think, is great because it, it is, it does remind us that the, that the police are deployed out there all the time. The fire department's not there driving around. They don't patrol and really neither do ambulance services. It's the police. And I think that's what, that infrastructure is already there. And I think that's why we can, that's, I think, what we harness in, in policing to bring out the best in them because they already have this infrastructure where they're out there and they're contacting people in situations where most of the time it's not an emergency. So, so, they, so they have time to do good stuff. All right, Mike's fantastic research in Tempe and your, Rob, your research in Philadelphia aside, I wanna get back to the subtitle of tonight's conversation, which is creating an anti-racist police force. We've got about 10 minutes left. Do we have racism in policing? And can we create an anti-racist police force or do we not need to make any change? Is this simply about, is this simply about social inequality? If we move it to the, to the public, if we take care of the public health and we, and we federalize it, it's all taken care of. 
Now that's, those are huge changes that probably will not happen in our lifetime. So my question is, do we have racism and policing and can we fix it? I know it's a huge Actually, question. I can't be more. A better, question is where, a better question is where don't we have racism? I, I don't. Institution. I'm not disputing that. I'm not. It's. I mean, seemingly it's everywhere, but in the vast majority of institutions that you might be talking about, it doesn't take somebody's life. Jim Fife did some really interesting research in uh, 1998. Okay, so probably before most people watching this were even born. I don't. I don't, I don't know how old that makes people in 1998. But, but the thing is, is he did some really interesting work um, uh, with Richard Burke and a grad student at UCLA, I can't remember his name. And um, this was about uh, dog, the canine deployments in the LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's Department. And what they, so long, long, it's a long story, okay? But, but what, so I'm gonna boil it, boil it down. What they found was this, police officers at the encounter level almost always deployed their dogs to, to bite they looked at bite to use ratios. Really important indicator of coercion. Dog bites just mess people up, okay? Uh, so looked at bite to use ratios. And at the encounter level, they found that by and large, police officers at that encounter level, they were, they were um, the bite to use ratios across racial groups were pretty equal to each other, Latino, uh, um, African-American and, and, and whites even. So at the encounter level, the outcomes looked pretty good, right? In terms of, of the distribution of bite to use ratios across groups. However, when they aggregated up and looked at police districts in the, in the LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's Department, they found that, that police dogs were deployed more to communities of color, Latino communities and, and um, African-American neighborhoods uh, at, at far higher rates than, than mostly white neighborhoods. And the crime rate and other indicators of, of of community safety didn't explain those higher dog deployments, higher rates of dog deployment, canine deployments. So the reason I bring this up is because it's a really complex issue. You can have policing at the encounter level that is essentially, that appears to be race, I hate, I'm not gonna use the term, that, that appears to be like fairly equitable and just, okay? It's when you aggregate up and you start to see these structural components of, of policing that can, uh, so, so people in neighborhoods of color were being bitten far more by dogs than people in white neighborhoods. And that was, those higher bite to use ratios were actually a function of, of higher deployments, not encounter level policing. That's, so when we talk about like structural racism, that to me is, an, is, is, a, is the quintessential example, because I'm sure that no one even had any idea or, or a few people had ideas that they have their own racial biases about you got to send dogs because that's na that neighborhood's over there. That's, that's Rampart District. Of course, we got to send the dogs. Maybe we'd have preconceived notions about, about the neighborhood. Okay, so But that's the structure that, that, we're, that people are talking about. That, and that's what makes this such a complicated story. Okay. Andrea, Mike? So, yes, I, I think I would answer the question as yes, we, we do have some racism in, in policing. Um, and I think um, it's not unique to policing alone, right? But it is different in the, in the same way that you described, Patrick, and then because of the coercive nature and, and the, the loss of life and things like that. Um, can we have a racist free policing? Um, I think we can do a lot to reduce the disparities that we have. And I do think that we can um, design structures and, and systems in a way that can get us there. I don't know if that will ever be zero. Um, I, I hope that we could get there, um, but I think we can definitely, I definitely think there's progress that can be made. Mike, thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with Andrea. I think that um, there's progress that can be made. Um, you know. Are we going to eliminate racism in housing and employment and education um, in policing? So I would add that to the mix. Um, you know, I think that you know the the steps to take to to reduce racism are fairly well known. Uh, yeah, let's start with what Rob said. Let's go out and look for people uh, that we can screen in. 
people who are empathetic, people who are tolerant, people who are patient, uh, you know, people who uh, have good critical thinking skills, not just the people who haven't been arrested for a felony. Uh, and then once we have them, let's train them. And let's not train them just in how to, to be tactically sound. Let's train them, um, you know, to be empathetic, sensitive, patient, good communicators. And then once they're on the street, let's make sure that they're supervised well. And when they violate policy and they do stupid things, let's make sure they're held to account for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an awfully good start. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you would agree with the notion that our police officers should be educated because the, I, and I had this conversation with somebody earlier today, the idea that we are not gonna require officers to have college education uh, blows my mind. Uh, the idea that we would expect 18, 19 year olds to understand social interaction and um, how to speak to people and conflict resolution. It, it would seem to me that we should be selecting in people who are educated. Uh, that, that, that is the, our students should be the perfect type of people who should be becoming our, our next law enforcement officers. I mean, is, that, is that fair? Our students though? Do you think our criminal justice students are the best uh, trained? I don't know if we train our students well enough. I think, I, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe actually, we got a problem at Georgetown. I don't know. We're doing pretty good at Gwen and Mercy, so maybe maybe that's just what I, you know. Maybe your students. That's right. Your students are probably yeah. yeah but Patrick, what did you just call it? You called it law enforcement officers. I mean, uh, they're, 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 they're police officers. I mean, policing and law enforcement. That so in a way, you're that. You, I'm giving I'm giving this back to you a little bit, but you're kind mm -hmm. of perpetuating the whole idea. The mandate of the police is law enforcement and coercion. So. No, uh, it, I didn't say law enforcement and coercion officer. I said law enforcement. Are they not required to enforce the law as it stands by the books? We have nobody else that does that, right? Not, unless I'm missing something. We, we don't ask our lawyers to do it. We don't ask judges to do that. That's the job of the police officer. Mm, well, okay. the, the, I mean, we can debate this all we want, but the, the, the cops are there to stop a situation. I'm, I'll call them cops. I'll go with this with a slight, yeah, we'll just call them cops. That, is that easy? Is that better? I'll call them cops. <laughs> but I think Andrew's point is interesting of our, our students. I mean, the thing is the, the, the entry, you know, uh, point of entry for police officers, basically high school diploma in a lot of places and, and often some, some community um, college. The police departments are tough though, because, you know, um, a lot of them would love to have uh, a bachelor's degree as the entry point into the job. But as I think most of us here probably know, it's difficult for them to uh, to require that because when the economy is going well and wants to get a job where they, they work Wednesday nights from midnight to eight, you know, or midnight to 10 uh, with a bachelor's degree, when you can go into a different sector of the college labor market and work a regular job and perhaps for more money and not get, uh, you know, uh, have the threat of somebody injuring you. So it is tough. It, it, it's tough for police departments to require a bachelor's degree when the economy is not going so great. Police departments around the country often uh, uh, only want to hire only hire people with college education, but it's it's just it's not. We'd have to reframe what it means to be a police officer in this country if we're going to require uh, a bachelor's degree as a point of entry. I had a student tell me today that he was is he's going to go into officer uh, officer training school for the Marines because he's got less a uh, less chance of getting shot and killed than he does of being a police officer in Philadelphia right now. He'd rather go into the Marines than be a, uh, to be a police officer. It's got to tell you something. Now yeah, uniforms are better. <laughs> yes, the uniforms are better. So um, we're just about at our time. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Mike White, Rob Kane, and Andrea Headley for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you all. This has been fantastic. I know if we weren't doing this on Zoom, it would have been really hard to get at least two of you um, back to Philadelphia. Um, because uh, frankly, Mike, I wouldn't have paid to fly you out. But it was great to see you all. I, I, I appreciate Art. having you all. <laughs> it was great to see you all uh thank you so much for uh, for participating in tonight's campus conversation um if anybody has any questions that's watching uh feel free to email um email me and i can pass them along to uh to our panelists this evening but thanks again for for having us thank you patrick this does show that you're doing good things at uh, at your university so <laughs> thanks for inviting thank you, i appreciate that andrew very nice to meet you mike good to see you Monday. What'd you say, Mike, you smart Alec? <laughs> Jim, you want to take over here?
Sure. Thank you, everyone, once again, for uh, being part of the campus conversation. Thank you to our panelists and for Patrick for putting this all together. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. All right. Take awesome. care. Bye.